So if, if someone wanted to supplement their their bodybuilding uh, regime yeah. with some cardiovascular style training, yeah. Um, with regards to the various signals and, and pathways and, and the kind of attenuation effect that, that there may be, is there a kind of best practice way for positioning it around your strength training to try and oh, reduce some of that interference? I mean, yeah, so essentially most of the time you want to do your strength training before, let's say you're doing it in one workout, mm-hmm. strength first, cardio next because of that system that made In the same like, session. Yeah, if you, if you, not everyone has the luxury to train twice a day right. and get to the gym twice a day. Right. So if you have to combine the two, start with your strength training, get that strength stimulus, mTOR activation, then the AMPK is not really going to blunt it as much. But, but if you're doing it, say, so in, in my world, if you're doing it in the one session, then if there is an interference, it will be great as if you're trying to do it in the one session. When you said that, I was like, "Correct. Why aren't you doing strength on Monday That's, and then do your cardio this is where we're on going Wednesday?" To next. Exactly. Exactly. So your next option is okay. You don't want to put because let's say, let's say you literally just can't mm. fit in enough workouts to get your cardio in. Yeah. It's like I'm only going to get mm. to the gym twice this week. I've kind of got to do all my strength right. and cardio in the one one or two sessions. Or else my strength volume might go down. The studies a lot. show yeah. strength first, cardio second is best to limit that interference effect, Yeah. right? Next best option, separate them AM, PM, so six, eight hours apart. Yeah. Then you're really going to actually mitigate the potential interference effect. Mm. But totally best option, different days, like you said. Yeah. So you got a cardio day, a strength day. Because the adaptation occurs in recovery, not in your gym session. That's it. So you cause the stimulus, yep. allow your window of recovery, Exactly. then any interference should be slighter. Absolutely. Right? Because if yeah. you're just doing it all in the one one hour session, I'd be saying, well, your muscle cell doesn't know, oh, did this AMP come from the strength half yeah. hour or the the running half right. hour? Yeah. You know, and the AMP is not different. It's the mm. same, right? Yeah. So um, AMP is what causes the attenuation of the the um, strength or hypertrophy adaptation. Yeah. So I think AMP right? kinase is one of the inhibitors of mTOR. Right. So in that case, it would make, if you were worried about the attenuation, it would make more sense to be doing lower intensity cardio, cardio rather than high intensity, which would produce more AMP. So I was going to, I was going to, I was going to put that on the table because Hmm. the other thing I was. Which does line up with a lot of bodybuilders. If you speak to them, the ones that do do cardio, they're not sprinting. No, no. Most of them will go and do a 60 minute slow to moderate intensity cardio. That's what I was going to say. Like, so you said, oh, what if you don't have time to get to the gym more than twice a week? You don't need a gym to do cardio. You don't. Right? So that is where, and I'll get really public health physical activity here on it, where like you're just incorporating that into your leisure time physical activity behaviors. Mm, Yes. Right? So it is, it's a, it's a long slow walk. Right. Or if I'm going to go to the supermarket that's, I don't know, a K from home. Yeah. I'll fast pace that. Yes. Mm. Try, right? and, try and get up to zone two. Yeah. 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 A brisk walk. or, or yeah. 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 And uh, depending upon what I'm doing around the house or what I'm doing in every day. So if I'm the person now that's taking the stairs versus the elevator, mm. if I'm the person who's brisk walking to this activity as opposed to slow walking, you're going to have that stress system in there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, walking pace, uh, from memory, I, like – I don't really get into that world of reading, but walking pace seems to be Preferred associated. Speed. Yeah, it seems to be associated speed, yeah. with some kind of cardiovascular disease Correct. risk. And that was the other thing. The other important thing about cardio, uh, about cardio, yeah. is as the name would suggest, it's nothing to do with your skeletal muscle. It's not your quad, your calf, your anterior mm. tibialis. It's your heart muscle that's right. important. So if you're living a life devoid of cardio, yeah. sure, your muscles might have the strength gains that you want or the look that you want. But what about your central system, yes. right? So the benefits of exercise that go far beyond the skeletal muscle, Absolutely. right? And cardio is the one that gives you the mental health benefits of an exercise, feel good endorphin kind of effect. It also impacts the cardiovascular adaptations that you get for a positive effect. Mm. And it, it impacts other systems yep. just other than skeletal muscle. Do you think it makes sense to try to exercise in particular energy systems, so target systems, right? In other words, let's have a workout that's very glycolytic, high intensity interval training, everything you got, 30 on 30 off for four minutes, repeat that four times. And then we have another workout that's moderate intensity, steady state, focused more on mitochondria machinery. And then we have another workout that's 
perhaps a blend like resistance training, strength training, body weight training. When you, when you look at our body as energy systems, you can see how we can actually train really different workouts will target different systems, right? Depending on, maybe depending on our sport or depending on what our objective is on that day, yeah. right? Then you sort of look at, not to point the finger again, but like F45, right? Okay. Which t for me is a blend, okay. right? It's, it's never been a one. I, I haven't done do. it either. Okay. But, but, <laughs> but for me, it seems like it's not zone two. Okay. It's, it's higher intensity than zone mm. two. Sounds like it would generate a lot of AMP. It does sound like, yeah. It sounds like you're sort of, you're not always in zone five. You're not sort of like high intensity yeah. the whole time, but you're sort of that zone three, four, right in between. Or maybe you're touching zone five and then you're coming down in recovery to zone two. Do you think that that sounds like a form of exercise that would tap into all of your energy systems in one workout? Or are we better off to actually have prescribed days where we're going, okay, today the objective is zone two day or a zone two workout. Let's hit the mitochondria efficiency today. Next session, let's go zone five. Let's really crank a zone five. And then another session that's, you know, is it is it sensible from a biochemistry standpoint to go, okay, let's separate our workouts into systems or should we just move our bodies? Yeah, it's Big a, question. Yeah, Sorry. it's an interesting one. So, and, and I guess that question, just to add to that, yeah. is where you're talking about best practice if someone could adhere to either way, because I guess some people just go just to 45 because it does it it's all. easy, yes. right? You yeah. don't have to think about it. But yeah. if we're think thinking about just optimizing, optimizing the human physiology, what would you be doing? Yeah, variety yes. is certainly a key to it. I agree with that. Whether your philosophy is to target the ind individual systems, like I think about the immediate energy system, which is your adenylate kinase, myokinase, phosphocreatine. So yeah. that's um, creatine kinase. Yeah. With sprint training, you see very little adaptation in those systems yep. over time. Like there might be subtle changes in the amount of the enzyme you've got around, mm -hmm. but when it comes to a performance measure, for example, those changes don't relate to it. Mm -hmm. It's more the changes in the fiber type or the hypertrophy cross-sectional area that's dominating the power performance, right? And that's your adaptation. Yeah. So uh, the capacity for individual metabolic systems to respond differently to stresses I don't think the data is there for it. Mm -hmm. What's important is that they're actually doing something. It comes down to the system having more mitochondria in it, yep. so that then there's a lesser stress on all the other systems, right. which we might utilize under times where there is a, exactly. an immediate okay. need. Right. right? So th th again, th this goes back to the premise of zone two. People say if you build that aerobic base yes. or spend a lot of time in zone two, that's going to help you at higher intensities. When you do those workouts that are accumulating lactate, yes. we can actually do something with that lactate if we have a good aerobic base. Exactly right. But the reverse may not be true. If you spend all your time in high intensities, glycolytic systems, you may not get a benefit. That's not going to help you at low intensity. Right. So if you can get the mitochondria working more efficiently, then you can keep lactate levels down at better. When you tap into those higher intensity workouts. Right. But if you only do high intensity training, well, how does that help your mitochondrial efficiency and the function of that machinery where you, when you're looking at just burning fat? Well, it sounds like it would help with mitochondrial biogenesis. Though. Because of the AMP buildup as a signal. Yeah. Right. So that's the thing. If you're, if you're in that system where you're stressing the immediate and intermediate, you're going to make more mitochondria. Okay. And that, so that system would definitely have more of the aerobic system sitting there waiting right. when you got there. So when um, when people started, when high intensity interval training first came out, yeah. there were a number of papers that came out and what it showed was it wasn't necessarily better than endurance training for stimulating mitochondrial biogenesis. Mm -hmm. It just happened quicker. Okay. So people doing, uh, what was it, eight seconds on, 12 seconds to, off. Yeah. For 60 for bouts, yeah. yeah, right? That was the first minutes, protocol. Right? Yeah, that was yeah, the yeah. first protocol that came out. And then 12, been, it was actually 8-12-20. 8-12-20, yeah. yeah. So 8 seconds, eight on, seconds on, 12, 12 seconds off, off for 20, 20 minutes. minutes. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, when you read the paper, the first week, nobody completed 20 minutes, mm. right? So, yeah, it's kind of like, it's folly to think it's that's what they protocol, did, yeah. right? It was actually, they, they, I think they did like five minutes for the first session before they killed over vomiting and yeah. what have you, right? Yeah. But within two weeks, they were able to complete a full 20 minutes. Yes. Anyway, the endurance group and the high-intensity interval groups, they both had more mitochondria at the end of the time. Mm -hmm. It's just that the high-intensity interval guys get there quicker. Got it. Right. And So is there a, let's say, for example, I want to improve, I want to be able to do more work for a given level of lactate. 
right? Which, yeah, okay. Which seems like that's an indicator as to how well I'm able to utilize lactate and mitochondrial function. Yep. Right. Would Would you say that um, doing high intensity exercise and producing more mitochondria is going to be better for me to be able to achieve that or sitting in like a moderate intensity, like a zone two and not focusing so much on biogenesis, but just focusing on the function of the mitochondria. Yeah, so... I'm, I'm not sure if that study has even been done. I think what, what I'm hearing here is what you're saying is, let's. so if you do your high intensity workouts, you get that AMP signal to create more mitochondria. We've got more mitochondria or more powerhouses, more of the machines, but if we're not oiling the cogs and the gears, mm. then are we getting the benefit of, of having more of it? So should mm. we be getting that signal, let's have more machines, but then also spending time in the workouts of lower intensities to actually oil the machinery so that it works well? Is that kind of what you're saying? So like- mm. But we, going back to one of Simon's questions though, if we're an average listener or general population who's worried about overall metabolic health, yep. doesn't matter how we got more mitochondria, what's important is that we got them. Okay. Right. So outside of your gym bout, the person who's got more mitochondria around, they're just finding life in general easier, easier yeah. and not generating as many uh, byproducts every time they walk up a stair or they go to the shops or something right, like that. Right. So but when we think about the endurance trained study versus a sprint interval trained study, they then got people to do time trials and the people doing, so a time trial is here's a fixed amount of work yep. and we're just going to time how long it takes for you to complete it. Yep. And it might be at a certain lactate threshold right. or it might be at 70% of their heart rate max or something like that. Yep. The people who had been training at the high intensity interval group and the sprint interval groups, they still improved their time trial event in yes. what would theoretically be an endurance event. Yes. Gotcha. Right? So they can still have that benefit. I'm trying, to, I'm racking the brain as to what happened to the endurance guys. Mm. Yeah. They would also have improved, but it's more what the magnitude of difference would have been. So over a period, so those zone two guys, as well as training, having to train for longer in their session, they might have to wait for a longer period of time, like weeks, months, right. yes. years. Yes, correct. To get that the adaptations benefit. are slower. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. For me, it's like, if you're investing in zone two, you've got to be in for the long haul. Yeah, it's going exactly to take a lot right. Of time. And the studies do show that mm. HIIT training actually improves VO2 better right. than… Which is why I think some athletes skip it. Yes. Right, because yeah. of that. It's such you, a long-term investment. You, yeah. It's right. hard to, to have that instant gratification because it takes years or months or years. But that comment you just made then, that the studies show that the HIIT guys improve VO2 more, feeds back into what I was saying before about whether or not you're training in a fatigue state or not. Yep. VO2 max, the test, it depends upon, like your number at the end depends upon who can sustain a power output at an RPE of 18, 19, and 20 longest. The longest, yes. Because we get you to exercise uh, you know, 50 watts for three minutes, yep. 100 watts for three minutes, 150 right. watts for three minutes, and now every minute I'm going to rank it up by 25 yeah. watts until you say stop. It's brutal test. And the eh? test has to be finished in like right. 12 minutes yep. before, so we know that it's physiological fatigue. Yes. And so we, when we get someone who's never done the test before, like they blow out, yeah. bam, like four minutes into the ramp, they're done. Done, yeah. But if we get them back three days later, they can do another couple of ramps, mm. right? Now, it's, it's not that they've adapted in three days. Mm. They just know more now what they can go through. Yes. Every When you get a trained individual to do a max test, without fail, yeah. you'll get them like five minutes after the test going, I could have done more. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Right, yep. and it's because they just haven't trained at that intensity level before. Mm -hmm. So, when we think about oh, like the hit guys, it in, it like it improved VO two peak better than the endurance. The endurance guys just never knew what it went to be exercising at an RPE of right. eighteen, nineteen, and twenty. Is mm -hmm. that is that an indicator yeah. of central? Versus peripheral fatigue. Oh, it's just awareness. It's, right. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, you don't know what you can handle. They didn't go to that zone. Never been no. there before. Yeah. yeah. It's like touching that adversity. It's like when you when you know how hard it is, you're like, okay, I, I, mm. yeah. I've been there. Been so, to that dark place. So how so, do you remove that in a, an experiment to try and actually see the, the well, true I think, effect? Oh, you have of, to do multiple max Multiple tests. bouts, yeah. Right. yeah so, or motivation. So you get people like sort of cheering you on to try to get you that extra, yeah. extra bit in the protocol. Because I remember yeah. in, even in the lab at uni, there were tests where you'd have to really motivate the untrained We'd be individual. Yeah, yeah. You'd be shouting, yeah. you'd be yelling yeah. in your ears, and just, come on, you yeah. can do it. Because you don't want them to quit from no. that central part before 
peripherally, they've actually got more left in And the all tank. you're really doing is distracting them from the pain, yeah. right? And the awareness of the effort that they're at. That's mm. what the shouting should be doing for them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, that's that's stuff from the 50s, you know, like mm. where they're firing off guns behind people without them realising or they've got people lifting weights hypnotised mm -hmm. or they've given them some speed or something like that. And you distract them from the awareness of the, of the effort and the pain they should be able mm. to push on longer. Mm. Um, but... Yeah, no, so from a research perspective, to get a proper estimate of somebody's VO2 max, you have to do multiple tests. Right? Mm. Yeah, you can't just do a one-off value.